Others are from body-worn cameras from the officers who were on the scene. Personally, I was sickened by what I saw because for me, it was another example of individuals who were using the cover of peaceful protests, hijacking those protests and using that cover to engage in violent and destructive behaviors. Because of the series of events that were put in place by these rioters, we had innocent lives who were, that were placed in danger. I have an officer whose he and his family are now subject to threats. I have a young black officer not yet three months on the job, who is subjected to some of the most horrific racial slurs that you would ever want to hear. During a time when I and other police chiefs across this country are being pressured to encourage young men and women of color to become police officers. And this young man who got into police work to make a difference, to be a bridge between him and the minority community is subject to these racial slurs, some of the worst slurs that you ever want to hear. You hear that in the video today. You see that. And so before we show these videos, I just want to give context to what happened that evening. Around 3 p.m. that Wednesday, uh, there was a planned demonstration at Townsend Park. And by all accounts, it was a peaceful demonstration that was planned. And in fact, it started out that way. And at some point, the demonstrators decided that they wanted to walk the streets uh, to convey their message across the community. And so we took 18 police officers out of service and dedicated those officers, these sworn uniformed police officers, to those demonstrators to allow them to walk the streets and peacefully protest and peacefully demonstrate, peacefully convey their message about racial inequality and injustice. And those officers did that. 18 officers who were not available at that point to answer 911 calls, not available to answer and respond to domestics or traffic accidents or walking or riding around the streets of our neighborhoods as residents of Albany have told me they want to see more of. It's not a problem for us because we understand the importance of allowing people to exercise their constitutional rights. And we took those officers out of, out of service and dedicated those officers to those individuals who were demonstrating throughout the streets of Albany. And we protected those young men and women who were out there. We protected them from traffic hazards and any other risk that they would have as they were walking the streets during the busiest time of the day. And as they approached the South Station, under the escort of these officers, that's when this peaceful protest devolved into a riot. And again, it wasn't everybody involved. This was a classic case that we've seen here in Albany and in other cities across America where individuals have hijacked and sabotaged these peaceful protests and used it as a way to create this violence and destruction that we saw. So the first video that, we'll, that you'll see is from an exterior fixed mounted camera. There is no sound to this video. And this goes for about four or five minutes. After that, we'll show you a series of videos from body-worn cameras from the officers who were on the scene. Those videos have sound. And so we'll queue up the first set of videos now. So what you're seeing right now is it's already, they've already arrived at South Station. Um, the officers are out front, and the officers are simply standing there to keep the peace. And this is what you're seeing here. And I want to make it clear, too, at this, at any point 
during this. Uh, these officers were not at any point uh, provoking or instigating anything. And in fact, at this point, the commander on the scene has made a decision that perhaps the presence of the officers is instigating the crowd. So he decided to, in order to de-escalate, order the officers back inside of, of the South Station. And once that happened, here's some of the reaction from those who were in the crowd. What you're seeing here is the ramp that's leading to the front door of the South Station, the entrance ramp. Officers are inside. At this point, they're locking the doors because they sense the heightened risk that is happening right now, the heightened danger at this point, and they're locking the doors. There's a person here with the backpack and the blue hoodie who's starting his destruction. You see more of that person in later footage. It's important to note here, the officers are not engaging these individuals out front at this point. What you're seeing here is totally without provocation from any officer. see it more clearly when we show the body worn camera video but at this point somewhere in here is when the window to the door of the south station was broken by one of the protesters So the next set of a series of videos that you will see actually have sound. These are from the body-worn cameras from the officers. And the first video you will see will depict the demonstrators as they're coming up Arch Street approaching the South Station. At this point, they had been escorted by the uniformed officers for an hour, hour and a half or so, and now they're walking up and leading and approaching the South Station. What's important to note here when you see this video is there is this narrative out there that as these individuals approached the South Station that they were provoked and instigated by police officers. That police officers set a series of events in motion that created this riot. This totally dispels that narrative. Go ahead, sir. Uh, leaping out uh, under your guidelines. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor, for mentioning that, because you're right, because we're going to run this. It's, um, this is raw video, and there is some, um, some language in here that may need to be censored uh, by your readers or viewers.
Stop here, Steve. What you're seeing periodically, you will see a hand that covers the, the video. The officer has a body-worn camera that's positioned center chest, but the officer is also wearing a mic that is similar to what I'm wearing right now. That's positioned because of the, the uh, way that the officer is wearing it somewhere nearby the, the uh, body-worn camera. You'll hear the officer transmitting. When that officer needs to communicate with dispatch or with other officers, that officer will key the mic. And when he's keying that mic, it temporarily obscures the video from the body-worn camera. Nothing that takes away from the substance of, of the, what you're seeing in the video, but I just wanted you to be aware when you periodically see that. It only lasts a couple of seconds when you see it, but that's why you see it. Pause it there, Steve. Okay, this is a, a high intensity light that's being played, that's being shined in the light of the officers that are there. Um, it's it's commonly used in situations where individuals are trying to distract um, officers during these sorts of high intensity situations. Um, and it's clearly what this is being used for right now. It's it can cause damage uh, to our officers and. It, it, just as importantly, during a situation like this, it is used to highly distract the officers uh, from, uh, from what's happening around them. Go ahead, Chief. Pause there, Steve. So what you're seeing right now is the, uh, the commander on the scene has made a decision that perhaps the presence of the officers right now is inciting the crowd. So as a means of de-escalating the behaviors of what is happening at that point, he made a decision to move the officers from outside to the inside. And that's what you saw there. Chief, when you're talking, you just talk in front of the mic. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Just another view of a short view of what you what you just saw. So the next series of videos you see are from the actual inside once the officers have left that area in, in the front. And you'll see them making an attempt to chain the doors at this point.
And as you've seen, there has been no provocation whatsoever from the officers to elicit this response from, from the individuals outside. And you just heard him say that the guy with the black hoodie just broke the window. Important to note, no riot gear has been worn by any officers up to this point. We don't have shields, we don't have helmets, so this narrative that the, uh, the equipment being worn by the officers triggered a response by these rioters outside is totally false. What you're about to see requires some explanation. So now we've had a we've had individuals who've demonstrated that they are violent. They've attempted to kick down the doors of the South Station. Um, there's other uh, violent behaviors that we saw outside of the South Station, and they've also broken a window to the South Station, and the behavior is escalating. And so at this point. It's imperative for officers to intercede in order to stop the threat to this building, in order to stop any other threats that may occur to anybody else who are outside. We obviously have some violent individuals out there, and the intent of the officers at this moment, as they're going out these doors, is to remove individuals from that ramp area of the South Station. That is the hot spot. That is the area where we are seeing the biggest threats at this moment. And we need that area clear for the safety of the peaceful protesters who are on the periphery out there, but also for the officers. And we need to maintain control of our police station. We've seen in other places where police stations have been overrun. There are critical equipment and supplies, technologies that cannot be compromised. 
And so officers at this point are going out to reclaim that area just outside, on the ramp area outside of the center, South Station, and to give the protesters space in an area um, just outside of that. And so that's what you'll see now. Okay, stop it there, Steve. This is a critical point also. Okay, this is the point where the officer took the megaphone from the person who was yelling uh, at the officer at that point. Now, I think it's important uh, for context at this point. Now, the station is under siege. They, some of those that are there have demonstrated vi extremely violent behaviors. Officers are trained to address threats at that point. There is a, a imminent threat to our station, imminent threat to police officers, and in order to minimize those threats, we have to deal with the distractions. A distraction such as shining a high-powered light in an officer's face in order to distract an officer from what's around him or her. A distraction where you have a megaphone that's three feet away from an officer doing a situation where there's heightened tensions, an extremely emotional situation where officers understand that this is potentially a life or death situation. It's certainly a situation where people can get hurt. It's, it is, it is certainly a situation where there's been demonstrated violence. Officers have to reclaim this space, and they have to address the threats as they are reclaiming this space. And adequate warning was given prior to any sort of intervention that they had with people who were on that ramp. If you heard, the officers were clearly telling individuals as they were coming out, clear the ramp, move from the ramp. Clear, concise, reasonable demands by those officers under the circumstances. And yet they're receiving these distractions that may potentially expose these officers to further harm. And so that puts into context why the high-powered light which they didn't get a chance to address, but which probably would have been addressed if it was there, why that was a, a, a concern, and why this megaphone that was three feet away from these officers' uh, face during this heightened situation where officers need to hear what's going on. They need, they have, uh, they need to, to monitor radio traffic. They need to know if there are other threats that are being broadcast at that time, and you've got this distraction that's there. That's why that was addressed at that point. Go ahead, Steve. Stop here, Steve, because I think this is an important pe uh, point also. You heard him say no more pepper. There's, there's this narrative that officers are indiscriminately using uh, some of these less lethal forms of uh, force. This was a case where a, a level of force, a less lethal uh, uh, form of force was necessary. When the threat, and it was used, and when the threat subsided, then they stopped. 
and there were clear commands. Once the threat no longer existed, no more pepper. So that shows that officers are, are using the force, but using de-escalation techniques based on the circumstances as they evolve. Go ahead, Steve. Okay, and this is the last one I, that we'll see. And, and just to set the stage for this one, this is after things had started to, uh, the, the tension anyway, has started to subside somewhat. And this is what's disturbing to me personally, among all of the, the other things. But here, you're going to have these men here who are going to berate a young black officer who is simply there to do a job, who's simply there to help his community, who got into this line of work to build bridges and to be a part of the solution, to be a part of, of, of building what, what has been fractured between police and the minority community. An officer who put himself out there. And this officer has done nothing to these men here. Hasn't antagonized them, hasn't said anything to them. This officer has simply been standing silent. And this is the treatment this officer got. Now, and, and, and again, and it wasn't just the one black officer. There were two or three other black officers who were subjected to this from these people during the scene. Go ahead, Steve. So when we hear this narrative that officers do not use discretion, um, totally false, you know, deplorable conduct that I saw. And, and I support my officers. It was extremely challenging, extremely stressful circumstances. Um, as I talked with elected officials earlier today, it was a, a situation that could have went a different way if we had less disciplined officers. 
And because of the training that these officers have, because of the type of people that we have in this organization, you know, they were able to withstand that type of um, uh, um, things that we were seeing from those individuals in our community. So with that, I turn it over to the mayor for her comments. Thank you, Chief. Um, I have to say our officers, particularly our black officers, were subjected to language and slurs that had they been uttered by a coworker, that coworker would have been fired. Um, they sought to de-escalate the situation. Um, they removed themselves from the front of South Station. It was only after the protesters were banging on the doors trying to get in, breaking a window, all of that done by protesters, not by the police, by protesters, in a scene that was eerily familiar to us and reminded me of what we saw at the Capitol on January 6th. None of that was reported by the media. Uh, many of you were not there when these incidents occurred, but some of you saw them and chose not to report them. Protesters violently assaulting South Station, using a blinding light to interfere with officers' ability to do their jobs, and screaming provocations, including disgusting racial slurs at black officers. You know, the way that these events are depicted in the media matters. The way that these events are depicted in the media can result in danger and violence. And it does matter. It does matter. And so I just know that I received my degree in journalism before most of you were born, but I believe that all of us were taught that the principles of truthfulness and accuracy and objectivity and fairness are a part of what we are taught. And it is critically important as we seek to move forward to address the uh, systemic racism that continues continues to result in black and brown individuals being subjected to danger. And, and these are serious life and death issues, serious life and death issues. But it is important that we, and we owe it to our residents to ensure that we are accurately representing that and reporting it to our residents so that we are not furthering and escalating what is an incredibly challenging situation for our officers and for protesters, for protesters who are angry and understandably so, for protesters who are tired of protesting and they say that, right? We understand that. When anything happens in any municipality anywhere in this country, we have come to understand that that rage is going to be brought to our streets. And our officers are trained to use as much restraint as possible. And in fact, to ensure the safety of those protesters, to ensure that they're able to express their anger and their rage in a way that keeps everyone safe. We block streets. We block traffic. My office gets phone calls. People don't like to be inconvenienced. But you know what? That is what democracy looks like. But assaulting a police station crosses a line. And while it's not violence that is physical, the slurs and the, uh, the, the tactics that were used on those officers, people, men and women who come to work every day uh, for the city of Albany, uh, as, as someone who is the mayor of the city, it is really hard to watch, to watch and to hear how employees of this city are addressed and are treated. Um, so I want to, again, um, you know, as, as I said to those in the media who wanted to know what I thought and had I seen the video, um, I have now seen the video. I understand uh, why our officers acted the way that they acted. Um, I commend them for the constraint that they showed. Um, I commend them for attempting to de-escalate the situation. And I hope that we do not have to uh, deal with escalation like that again. Uh, but this is a department that is trained and that has my complete confidence. Thank you.
and in the most extreme cases, there is an active element of police departments that is looking to oppress people of color. If that were the case, I'm assuming you would agree, as it relates to this department, that their reaction would be more understandable as far as what happened on Wednesday. But I'm assuming you don't believe that's the case as it relates to this department as far as active oppression of communities of color goes. So how important is it to correct the idea that people think that this department is engaged in, in odious behavior? And uh, Daryl is step by step, and it starts with things like this, by dispelling the fa false narratives. And there was a false narrative out there regarding this. You know, there was a narrative out there that the pol Albany police officers instigated, set the events in motion that resulted in chaos and that violated the rights of people, that oppressed people. That's, that's furthest from what happened, as we can see in this video. And so I think the first step is to dispel these false narratives, but also to make sure that we continue doing th things the right way. You know, people, need, people want to see constant reinforcement that we're doing things the right way. And, and that's what I'm committed to. That's what the officers in this department are committed to. That's what this administration is committed to. Is there a militia group in this area? There were a couple of people there with some sort of uniform on. What, what's that about? I, uh, don't, I don't know anything about any militia group that was there. So. Will you be able to press charges, or will you be pressing charges? We, we have been in communication with the district attorney's office, and we will be fully pursuing any uh, opportunities for criminal charges. And from what I saw in this video, there are several opportunities for it. We'll be working very closely with the district attorney's office to identify those. The protesters say, you know, they call for resignation because they see what happens around the country in other incidents. And they say, you know, the officer pulled the megaphone from my hands, he should be fired immediately. What is that fine line between when an officer should step down or should be, you know, suspended versus uh, keep working? Well, for me, the line is clear. If an officer does something inappropriately or if an officer violates the law, then there should be some repercussions uh, up to and leading to termination. In this case, it's my personal belief that the officer didn't either. Um, as I explained as we watched this, um, this was an extremely highly emotional event uh, in which our police department was attacked, police officers were attacked, and there was noncompliance. And in addition to all of that, there were these distractions, these intentional distractions that were introduced by people within that crowd. And our officers are trained under limited, narrow circumstances. If we have a dangerous situation and there are distractions, we are to as safely as possible remove those distractions from that situation. In my opinion, that was, that was what was done. What are you expecting this weekend, if anything? Well, there are some demonstrations that are, that are planned, and I'm expecting those demonstrations to be peaceful. So where are those, and will police have a presence there? We'll have a presence there, just a loose presence, not in the demonstrations themselves. Uh, but, you know, we always increase our, our uh, officer staff for traffic-related reasons. You know, usually um, it, it impacts traffic in the area. And also, if we have to devote some officers uh, to that area for whatever reasons, we need to make sure that we have enough officers to answer regular calls for service from our community. So we may have a heightened presence for that, but we're, we're not expecting any violence. So is it overtime time over the weekend? Because we talked yesterday about the fact that people had to be diverted because it was unexpected. Now that you expect it, is it all hands on deck, essentially? It's a little bit of both. You know, depending on the size and uh, the number of demonstrations that we see, sometimes we have to call in overtime. You know, these, these, uh, we support the rights of individuals to peacefully um, uh, 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 air their, their constitutional grievances or, or to, to peacefully protest. We support that 100%. But we also understand that, that it's costly because when it happens, we have to devote additional officers sometimes just to make sure that they can exercise those rights, those peaceful rights, in a safe way, and so we may have extra offers for that. Now we know that Albany Common Council is taking up a resolution. They're voting back and forth on whether to remove or keep the use of rubber bullets and tear gas in uh, officers' use. What are your thoughts on that? Well, my thoughts are that those sorts of less lethal options are absolutely necessary. They should be used under extremely narrow circumstances. 
uh, there should be um, strict training uh, as it pertains to de-escalation, and we saw that with this. Um, this was uh, pepper spray. It wasn't tear gas, but it was pepper spray. It was a less lethal form of, of force, and when the threat subsided, then the appropriate decision to de-escalate was made. And so as long as though that sort of discretion and training is used, then those sorts of options can be used safely to, to, to keep our community safe during some of these things. So I applaud the Common Council's desire to address the use of non-lethal force, tear gas, rubber bullets. There has been a lot of concern about uh, the use of those non-lethal methods, and I believe that we have to ensure that our community um, trusts the APD uh, and that APD is not using tear gas in, um, you know, not in situations indiscriminately. Um, under my leadership, I have reached out to mayors across the country. I've reached out to the U.S. Conference of Mayors um, to consult, and we've done a significant amount of research on um, best practices with respect to the deployment of nonlethal force. Um, our research has failed to find a single city or state that has adopted a complete ban as contemplated in the legislation that is currently in front of the Common Council. I strongly support legislation that would restrict the control and use of non-lethal force, tear gas, and rubber bullets, um, restricting its use for only when a riot is declared, um, as defined by New York State law, um, or in a hostage or active shooter situation, uh, requiring that the orders to use it come from the police chief or a deputy chief, um, requiring two warnings uh, prior to the deployment, um, requiring that EMT support be available and prohibiting its use in residential neighborhoods unless it is absolutely necessary to protect lives. Um, so those are the um, restrictions that I do support. Um, in the last 32 years, uh, tear gas has been used, to my knowledge, twice. Um, both were in res response to uh, incidents that would fall within the de definition of riots under New York State law. Um, we have a police officer who still is not fully recovered from the injuries that he received um, during uh, the night of May 30th. Um, you know, I understand that uh, some of the people who uh, participated in the policing collaborative want us and, and, and called on us to address the use of tear gas, and I believe that amending the legislation, um, as I've laid out with the carve-outs that were described, um, is the proper way for us to move forward. I think that that is what is responsible. Um, we have not, and nor has anyone on the council, notwithstanding us asking them, um, identified a, a, another non-lethal force, use of force, that, would, would, w that we would be able to deploy in order to prevent, um, for example, a response to an insurrection like what happened in Washington, D.C. on January 6th. Um, and so I think that we do not want to be in a position where the only viable alternative, if City Hall were to be attacked in that way, is to either do nothing or use lethal force. So I believe that, that uh, those types of caveats have been adopted in other um, uh, municipalities and in other jurisdictions. I think it's important to pass legislation because I think it's important for the community to understand that we hear them, that we've listened to them, um, that we understand their concerns, and that this is a police department that will hold itself accountable to and listen to those concerns from the public. So I do think it's important to pass legislation, uh, but that that legislation needs to include common sense amendments that will ensure that we can keep our community safe. And so, um, you know, I will await and see what the council does, um, what they end up proposing, um, before I make a decision about vetoing that legislation. So Mayor, what's your, your position on Local Law J for subpoena power for the CTRB? Sorry, what? Local Law J for subpoena power for the CTRB is something that's kind of controversial, where some people believe it would give them too much power, others think it would provide trust for the community. Where do you fall on I that? support subpoena po power for the CPRB. Yes, I do. Uh, so does that mean that you support uh, Council Member Kimbrough's amendments to the tear gas? I have not seen those amendments. It's my understanding that his amendments um, are, I, I just haven't seen them physically, but that they um, uh, lay out certain carve-outs and exceptions that I believe are aligned with what I've just described. Mayor, in regards to your original statement, uh, where you kind of 
gave up the lashing. Don't you think, <laughs> don't you think that um, statements like that are also dangerous? I mean, you just essentially said that we were all trying to hide what happened. When I can only speak for our station, we were there, we covered it, we showed the damage to the police station. But the problem is, is that when you say statements like that, people hear that and then start thinking that we are lying to them or other media agents are lying. Don't you think that is a dangerous move? Well, what I what, what happens at the police station to what happened at the Capitol is also very dangerous. Well, what I said was many of you weren't there for those incidents, and so you had no way of reporting them. But there were people who were there, and I think it is very important that when you are talking about uh, what occurred, uh, that to the extent that there is a narrative that is coming from social media and from the video cameras and, and, and live feeds, not of you and your reporters, but of people who are at these uh, events and at these protests, that that doesn't tell the whole story. So when I have a microphone, you know, shoved in my face and a camera asking me to respond to the video, you're talking about a protester's video. You are not talking about the video or video cameras or the, the video that we are reviewing to assess what happened in that situation. And that's what I, you know, that's what I'm responding to, is that, you know, as journalists, you report what you see. And I'm not suggesting that you didn't do that. What I'm suggesting is that when we report what other people want us to see in their social media feeds, as if that is the only thing that happened, that is the only perspective, that it, provide, it, it, that it presents challenges. And we've seen this across the country um, with, with social media and with people uh, you know, being able to and having the ability, not as journalists, you're journalists, um, but not as journalists, but as you know, members of the public streaming what they want people to see, which is not, which as we know, is not the whole story. So that's what I'm responding to. And I think it's very important that our residents have the opportunity to get the whole story. I think we have time for two more. Else? How do you break the vicious cycle? You know, I think we need to provide space. And, and the chief and I have done this. We've had, um, you know, you're seeing this, right? You're, you're seeing the, the protests and you're seeing our response. Um, what you don't see are the one-on-one -on -one conversations that the chief and I have with members of the community. What you don't see um, are those, those uh, moments where um, we are sitting with other elected officials or with members of the public to say, how do we solve this problem, right? You know, the chief talked about what these officers were trained to do. Now, we can have a conversation about whether you like that or not, right? You know, if, if the public, just like what we're, what we're talking about now with tear gas legislation, if the public doesn't like what we're doing, we want to have a conversation about that, right? The chief needs to have the opportunity to explain why, and we need to hear from the community and from others about why we might want to do it another way, and that's how we will move forward with change. That's what happened in the collaborative. There are many good ideas that we look forward to implementing that have come out of the collaborative. Things that allowed us to hear each other, to listen to each other. You know, I received emails from people who I don't think I've ever heard <laughs> have a good thing to say about the police, who wrote to me to say it was a good thing that we had police officers participating in the collaborative. I learned some things from them. They actually got information to me that was important for me to hear. Right? That's where the change will come from. And that's what we need to, to do. We need to create the space to have those conversations and to be serious about change. And, and I, you know, I am serious about change. I am serious about the fact that we are where we are because of structural racism, systemic racism, out and out racism. The, 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 you know, the anger that exists in the community, you know, I am not here to, to, to suggest that that anger is not righteous, because it is. And we have to find a way to work together. Mayor, what we saw on Wednesday, is it fair to say that 
with all the effort that everyone here has put in, with the collaborative, with you, even before, with the previous Chiefs, Sears, Brendan Cox, et cetera, we still had this happen. So has it really worked? Well, look, I think absolutely it has worked. You know, we are moving forward with change. You know, we are seeing a perspective. And I think that there are people who agree that we need to change policing in this country who do not agree with the tactics that were deployed against our police officers and do not agree with the way that the protesters um, are, are, um, are, are seeking to bring about that change, right? But there has always been a place in this country for protests, and there always should be. Um, and in this city, as far as, you know, <laughs> as, as much as we can, can, you know, make that happen, there always will be. There always will be. Um, it's when it crosses the line, right, to destruction and putting people in danger that our police department has an obligation to protect our, our, us, our property, our residents. So, uh, you know, I, I'm, I am very optimistic that change will come. But I also am not going to suggest that it's just as simple as creating policies because we have to, we have to change a culture, right? We have to change a culture. And we have to give people the tools that they need to be successful. And that's the commitment that I have to have to every department, every employee in the city of Albany. They have to have the tools that they need to be successful. And some of the changes that we're going to be making is going to change. It's going to change the expectations that we have of police officers. It's going to change some of the responses that we send police officers on. And it's going to make sure that they have the tools and the training that they knew need to be successful in the job and to do the job the way that the public expects them to. We owe that to them. Thanks. Thank you.